This launch event for uh, Dan Philpott's book, Just an Unjust Peace, is uh, being co-sponsored by the Religious Freedom Project and the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. Uh, it truly is an honor to have uh, Daniel Philpott, who has uh, been working on the issues of reconciliation uh, and uh, transitions out of past injustices into a uh, future of justice and reconciliation for many, many years. I should emphasize that uh, Daniel Philpott is uh, very, very unique in that he is not just an armchair theorist of how to manage uh, situations of injustice and conflict. He is an active uh, and expert practitioner. Uh, Dan Philpott has spent time in a number of post-conflict countries and, in fact, countries where there is not just post-conflict but active conflict. Uh, he has spent time in Kashmir uh, organizing seminars that uh, teach principles of forgiveness and reconciliation uh, to Hindus and Muslims. He has spent uh, a lot of time now recently in sub-Saharan Africa, particularly in Rwanda and Burundi, uh, which of course are areas of Africa that have seen terrible ethnic conflict. So uh, Professor Philpott has uh, actively engaged this issue in a practical way on the ground around the world. On top of that, he has written in this book uh, an extraordinary treatment of these issues and has laid out not just uh, a, a set of uh, uh, ideas, but really a comprehensive framework rooted uh, in political philosophy and theology uh, for uh, uh, implementing an ethic of reconciliation uh, in cases where there has been severe injustice and conflict. And the book is uh, extraordinary uh, in part because it engages a wide range of religious traditions, it engages a wide range of philosophical traditions, and so it's not surprising uh, that uh, the book has uh, received rave uh, reviews from the likes of Marianne Glendon, uh, Alistair McIntyre, Nicholas Walterstorff, uh, Jean Elshtain. Uh, the book is being widely reviewed, uh, so it is a great honor to have uh, Daniel Philpott with us. And it's a mark of the power of uh, Professor Philpott's book that we've been able to engage an outstanding panel of some of the uh, country's most outstanding experts on forgiveness and reconciliation, uh, Mohammed Abu Nimer, Lisa Cahill, uh, and uh, Mark Gopin. Um, Mark Gopin is, as you can tell, not here right now, uh, but he is on his way. Um, he begs our forgiveness uh, for um, the fact that this uh, event slipped his mind, um, and we do forgive him in the spirit of reconciliation. What else could we do? Uh, so we will actually see religious reconciliation being practiced uh, right, right before our eyes uh, in the next couple of hours when, when Mark Open comes in and we, uh, we smile at him as opposed to, to glare at him. Uh, so we, um, we look forward to welcoming Mark Open uh, uh, later on. The format today is very, very simple and straightforward. Uh, uh, Dan Philpott will begin with a series of remarks of about 10 minutes about his book, laying out the basic arguments and framework. Uh, we'll then hear from Lisa Cahill, uh, and then we'll hear from Mohammed Abu Nimer. Uh, you have uh, bios uh, in front of you, uh, so I will not give uh, long introductions to our speakers. If you've done any reading at all about conflict resolution or reconciliation, you would already know uh, these people. Uh, so in, in a sense, they don't need any introduction uh, today, uh, but I will provide just short introductions before each of them uh, speak. Let me, of course, begin with uh, our author, uh, Daniel Philpott. Uh, uh, Dan is associate professor in the Department of Political Science, uh, and he's also uh, in the Joan B. Kroc Institute for Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, uh, Dan is the author of Revolutions in Sovereignty, How Ideas Shaped Modern International Relations. Uh, he is uh, co-author uh, with me and uh, Monica Toft of a book called God's Century, Resurgent Religion and Global Politics. Uh, he's written numerous articles on religion and international affairs, uh, focusing on uh, t concepts and topics of sovereignty, religious freedom, self-determination, and foreign policy, and of course, uh, now he has just come out with 
uh, this magnificent book, Just and Unjust Peace, An Ethic of Political Reconciliation. Uh, let me say one more thing, uh, and that is that this book is on sale right now, outside, uh, so don't leave without buying your own copy uh, of Just and Unjust Peace. Dan Philpott. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Great. Well, greetings, uh, everyone. I want to begin by uh, thanking the Berkeley Center for uh, this wonderful opportunity to share my ideas about uh, my book and uh, providing this platform here in uh, the nation's capital. I also uh, very grateful to uh, uh, Lisa Cahill, Mohammed Abu Nimer, and to soon to be um, Mark Gopin for uh, being commentators. I, uh, Berkeley was kind enough to give me the leeway to uh, choose the commentators. And so this is uh, truly my dream team. And uh, so I'm very grateful to them to, uh, that they would come. I'd like to begin by um, asking you to fly with me uh, in your mind to northern Uganda in uh, eastern East Africa, a place that um, has been convulsed by war for over 20 years, uh, beginning in the late 1980s, a war between um, a kind of cultish uh, guerrilla group, religiously uh, informed, uh, called the uh, Lord's Resistance Army, uh, and on the other side, the Ugandan government. Um, uh, a war with a very high death toll. The um, uh, Lord's Resistance Army recruits its members, its army, by abductions. And so um, some 20 to 1,000 child soldiers were abducted and forced to uh, carry on the killing of the, um, of the army. And, um, and at, at one point, the war had caused uh, uh, 2 million people to be um, uh, forced to live in uh, camps for internally displaced people. Well, uh, the question ar has arose, of course, uh, how can peace be achieved? And um, proposals started to uh, appear for peace, uh, approaches to peace by the mid-1990s. And it evolved into the site of two very different approaches to peace building, and two very different approaches that ended up kind of modeling a conversation that in fact, has been replicated around the globe. So we can see this as kind of a, an exemplary case in that sense. On one hand, um, is an approach exemplified by um, the International Criminal Court. Many of you may know, know of the courts. It, um, it's really um, a kind of attempt to revive the precedent of the Nuremberg trials, where there could be an international tribunal for um, individual war criminals and human rights violators um, who had committed terrible crimes. Um, Uganda was the site of the first indictments. That's why it's kind of a, a banner case for me. The, the uh, uh, site of the first indictments of the International Criminal Court, which indicted five Ugandan perpetrators of war crimes in the Lord's Resistance Army. Um, some of you may also know of Uganda through the famous uh, video, the Kony 2012 uh, video. This was a video produced by an NGO called Invisible Children and released uh, this past uh, March. It, the video instantly went viral and uh, ended up getting 100 million hits, became an internet uh, phenomenon. But, and what it was trying to do was, in a sense, lobby the U.S. government for military action in Africa that could help to arrest Joseph Kony, the leader of the Lord's Resistance Army, um, which I think is a good, a good thing to do. The other the, uh, real star of that video was um, uh, um, Luis uh, Moreno Ocampo, the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. And so in a way, this, this video, uh, Kony 2012, um, was de designed to stir up activism, which it did. But if you look at the approach to peace building that was embedded in it, it is very much this kind of uh, international community ICC uh, style approach. Well, a very different approach to peace building came from an unlikely source, uh, religious leaders. Um, namely, a group of religious leaders called the Acholi Religious Leaders Peace Initiative. Now, this was a remarkable group of uh, religious leaders who were including the Catholic cardinal, the Anglican um, bishops, and as well as uh, the local Muslim leader, who ended up devising a whole approach to uh, peace building that was very different. They themselves courageously went out into the bush to meet uh, Joseph Kony, um, and they ended up becoming um, major advocates of the Amnesty Act of 2000, which was um, a, a law that sought to demobilize and reintegrate um, you know, child soldiers th through an amnesty law. In other words, we're not going to punish you if you give up your arms and, and come home. Um, they very much placed the problem of reintegration at the uh, center of their efforts, but in many ways they draw, drew from their religious 
logics, their theologies, their traditions. Uh, forgiveness was a major, um, a, a major component of their message. Not forgiveness in isolation, but forgiveness rooted in other practices like uh, reparations and accountability and truth-telling. But nevertheless, forgiveness. Uh, uh, promoted as a major tool for reintegrating people back in, back in villages together where they had lived together who had been estranged by terrible acts of violence. Well, what Uganda has generated is two answers to a question that has been asked all over the globe in the past generation, and indeed the question of my book, what is the meaning of justice when massive injustices have taken place? The book finds its setting in what amounts to one of the most interesting global trends of the past generation, a proliferation of activities and institutions to address injustices of the past in the interest of peace building. Um, think of the criminal court and, and as well as a host of tribunals for trying war criminals all over the world. We've seen 40 truth commissions, reparation schemes, apologies are breaking out all, all over the place in, in a political context. Forgiveness is being talked about in global politics in a way that it wasn't, say, 40, 50 years ago. A building of monuments and memorials, and even efforts to build reconciliation at the level of civil society. That, that's been my entree into this uh, subject. I was involved in Kashmir, working for an NGO, uh, making trips over a period of six to seven years, and more recently have been involved in Central Africa under the auspices of the Catholic Peace Building Network. Well, it is in just this setting that the question is asked, what is the meaning of justice in the wake of massive injustice? The dominant answer to this question is what may be called the liberal peace. It's dominant because it prevails in the leading global institutions, the UN, Western governments, and so forth. By liberal, I mean based on the ideas of the Enlightenment, like individual rights, human rights, and the rule of law, and uh, play, with a very central role for uh, judicial prosecution. And the ICC can sort of be thought of as the signature idea of the liberal peace. But an alternative challenger paradigm has also arisen. It has shaped the approach to this question in South Africa, Timor-Leste, Guatemala, Chile, Sierra Leone, Uganda, and many other places. And it goes by the name reconciliation. If rights is the central idea of the liberal peace, the central idea here is restoration of relationship. It is a holistic restoration. It includes human rights, I believe, does not reject them, but it's much wider, aiming at addressing the wide range of wounds that war and dictatorship inflict on people. It addresses these wounds be both because it is intrinsically just to do so and because doing so helps to build up qualities like trust and legitimacy for democratic governments and peace settlements. Unless people's emotions of hatred and revenge are addressed, peace and democracy are not likely to be sustainable. Now this way of thinking about justice, I argue, comes to us from religious traditions. And in the book, I highlight Judaism, Christianity, and, and Islam. Although I think it could be you know, extended to other religions in ex interesting ways. In the scriptures of these faiths, restoration of right relationship characterizes the action of God, but is also prescribed for horizontal relations uh, within human communities. Reconciliation is not some utopian end state where everyone is hugging each other. I ha rather have in mind political reconciliation, where people respect one another's rights as citizens. But even political reconciliation requires far more than rights, law, and prosecuting war criminals. The book outlines six practices that address the range of wounds that political injustices inflict, and each in their own way seek to bring about the restoration of persons and relationships. Briefly, they are the building of socially just institutions, acknowledgement, reparations, what I call restorative punishment, apology, and forgiveness. Each of these practices has taken place all over the world in scores of countries around the world uh, over the past generation. It's also worth saying that they are always partially achieved, far from perfect, hobbled by power, complexity, and the sheer magnitude of suffering. But even if partially uh, achieved, they do take place, and stories and accounts from around the world reveal that they also uh, yield successes. The most controversial of the practices, and the one that most challenges the liberal peace, I believe, is forgiveness. It is the only practice that is not based on rights at all. No perpetrator has a right to be forgiven um, uh, by a victim. It is rather based on the goodwill of the victim, and as many would say, the grace of God. It has a dramatic, surprising quality, one that interrupts what is expected in terms of deserts and entitlement. Um, 
a, uh, you know, there are prominent criticisms of, of forgiveness, which I seek to address in the book. One of the central points that I make is that forgiveness can be defended as a constructive act, not just a kind of relinquishment of, uh, you know, any kind of redress, but a constructive act by which a victim seeks to uh, become an agent and, and build a right relationship and thereby attains a kind of uh, dignity and re-empowerment in doing so. Today in Uganda, tens of thousands of people who were abducted into the LRA or lived in camps for displaced people are now reintegrated into their communities. In a trip there in August, I was widely told that there is still no peace. Perhaps in terms familiar to peace studies people, there is negative peace, but there is little more. Uh, there are land disputes, there are uh, many um, uh, scores of um, disputes uh, remain, uh, from, from the conflict that remain to be settled. But most were convinced that the solution is practices of reconciliation that can restore relationships. Uh, reconciliation was frequently spoken by people in that context. I might also add that today the ICC has neither tried nor convicted any of the people that has, it has indicted and some believe that it has even prolonged the war. Um, we might think about what applications might this have for American politics, especially in an age of polarization towards the wounds of our own past, slavery and the denial of civil rights, Vietnam, abortion, what have you. Um, how might social relationships change if we were to see justice not so much in terms of competing rights and claims and deserved punishment, but in terms of right relationship? I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you very much, Dan. Well, that was uh, an extremely impressive uh, summary of a very, very rich argument. You can already get a, get a picture, even if you haven't yet read the book, of the depth of Dan Philpott's argument and of the way in which it uh, apparently seamlessly transcends so many disciplinary divides that uh, afflict the modern academy. The book uh, draws on uh, political science, uh, but moves across uh, theology, uh, social ethics, in, in, an, in an extremely unusual and powerful way. Well, thank you, Dan. Uh, it's now uh, uh, a pleasure and privilege to introduce Lisa Cahill, uh, really one of America's uh, foremost uh, Catholic social ethicists. She is J. Donald Monin, professor in the Department of Theology at Boston College. Uh, her scholarly interests lie broadly in the area of Christian ethics, especially Catholic social ethics, sex and gender ethics, New Testament and ethics, bioethics, the history of Christian ethics, and the ethics of war and peace. Uh, she has been involved in uh, work uh, associated with the Kroc Institute at Notre Dame on peace building uh, and uh, uh, reconciliation. She is a past president of both the Catholic Theological Society of America and the Society of Christian Ethics, and she is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, I could go on and on. Uh, we're delighted and honored to have you, uh, Professor Cahill. Thank you. So uh, it's an honor to be here, and I was really delighted to be invited to participate. Um, I am coming at this as a Christian theologian, specifically a Catholic theologian, and also someone who is interested in um, peace building and reconciliation, although I am more a theologian than an activist and, you know, on the ground practitioner. Uh, I first got to know Dan through the Catholic Peace Building Network when some theologians were brought in to help uh, write a book which <coughs> wound up, you know, being constituted by many chapters uh, around a theology of peace building. And um, again, as uh, part of this project, the theologians were invited to conferences in Mindanao, the Philippines, in um, Bujumbura, Burundi, and in Bogota, Colombia. And one of the things that I really took away from that, in a new way, I mean, it made a, a much deeper impact, is that uh, peace building and reconciliation and talk about justice and social reconstruction all have to go on in the midst of concrete circumstances that are still very violent, very conflicted, very intransigent, and very unending. And as I reflected on my own theological heritage in the Christian tradition, I realized more and more that a lot of the social ethics focuses too much on the ideal outcome and then doesn't really know what to do with the fact 
that we're living in an interim where you can't just stand back, but the conditions are far from perfect. In Catholic social teaching, we talk about the dignity of the person and the common good and so on, which is great, but right now there are still these wounds that undermine the dignity of the person. There's a lack of just institutions or impunity that damage the common good. So what do we do there? Okay. Um, there's one uh, sort of uh, Christian answer that also is present in, uh, in Catholicism that I also don't find more satisfactory than the idealism of much Catholic social teaching, and that's a kind of Augustinian strand that says, well, the world is what it is. You know, Augustine in uh, The City of God, uh, Book 19, gives the notorious example of the judge who tortures who, uh, uh, a defendant who is probably innocent, and he just says, well, I may have tortured him, I had to torture him. At the end of the day, he was innocent, but he was still tortured, and we still didn't find out the, uh, you know, the answer to the questions he was being asked. Uh, but this just shows us that we live in the midst of miserable necessities, um, and these are the things we must do. Okay, so you're neither taking the super ideal approach nor the resignation to evil that almost condones participation in it. But you're realizing that there's no easy path. And I love this book for that reason. Uh, in fact, I, I just finished a book myself on Christology and global ethics, and I cited in it your earlier article from that Just Peace making book, which has many of the same things. This book was not out by the time I handed in the manuscript. But, uh, you know, the highest compliment <laughs> one author can pay to another is that you actually cite their work and trying to construct your own ideas. So um, you show that, um, you know, there's a, a great need in theology and in these peace building activities for something like a virtue of ambivalence. Um, uh, and the ambivalence is partly due to continuing human failure and sin. It's partly due to the depths of these wounds that you talk about, uh, such as, you know, harm to the flourishing of the victims because they've on, undergone violation of their human rights. But there's also harm to the flourishing of the perpetrators who have now become sort of entangled uh, in this evil. Um, there's overall an ignorance of, you know, what really happened and what caused this and who is really to blame. Um, there's, there's even a, a lack of official acknowledgement of the victim's suffering. And of course, bigger than that, the standing victory of the injustice, often manifest in impunity toward perpetrators. So there are, there are just many of these conditions that continue. And even if the goodwill is there to overcome these, there's still the ongoing difficulty of the circumstances that people are in. So um, what you offer us in this book, and I think, and in the earlier article, but this is much more developed, is really ethical criteria to guide us through that troublesome gray area of ambiguity, failure, striving, and yet only partial success. And the criteria, the, the, the point of the whole thing is to finally achieve a social situation where there's what, um, you know, Ro uh, Bob Schreider calls a new narrative. The narrative of the lie has been overcome and there's a new narrative in, under which we'll all go forward together. And your practices are those criteria. So the, the practices that you suggest as part of the uh, process of recon reconciliation are, you know, acknowledgement of the wrong done, apology, punishment of perpetrators, or at least representative perpetrators, forgiveness, reparations to the victims, and of course the attempt to build more just uh, institutions, however haltingly. A second thing that I really like about this book is the um, complex role that it has for religion and the interreligious uh, cross-fertilization that can often be part of a reconciliation process. At one point um, on page 116, if anyone would like to follow this in the future, you speak of rooted reason. So you're not saying, well, it's just religious belief and that's kind of idiosyncratic, but you're saying that reasoning is always rooted in traditions. There's no such thing as neutral, secular, tradition-free reason. So reason's rooted. 
And when we um, acknowledge the religious roots of our reasoning, uh, it allows several things. As you say, we can present our full rationales uh, for what we're doing and thinking, but we can also enter into a dialogue with people from other traditions, religious or otherwise, to try to achieve mutual mm -hmm. understanding and hopefully some sort of, as you, you know, put it using Rawls's term, overlapping consensus. Um, what you said about this made me reflect a little further on what I really think is going on in religious appeals in public. And um, I have kind of concluded or maybe drawn out of what you said that first of all, those religious appeals have to be inviting, not dogmatic or exclusionary or triumphalistic. It's more a sharing, okay, this is my view of God and the transcendent and does that resonate with anything in your tradition? And you do that very well by looking at Islam and Judaism and Christianity in your book. You know, people from those traditions may say other things, but there's a, the invitational welcome and outreach to these other traditions. I also think that when you um, bring in religious appeals, it shows your level of personal investment. Like, like peace building is about what I think is the most important in human existence. And I'm tying this to the values that I hold most do dear. But I also think that the real cash value in religious appeals is a sort of um, public universalizing appeal based on consensus, but not based on reason. Not irrational either though, but it's reaching toward a level of human cognition that is affective, that is imaginative, um, that is transcending and, and empathetic. And it's a way of um, uh, sort of expressing a conviction um, that religion does name or give voice to a shared human reality which is compassion, which is solidarity, which does aim for peace and justice and reconciliation, and which finds that to be inspired and enabled um, by a higher reality or a, a, a deeper order of possibilities. Um, so it, it's not just something always that can be expressed in secular language, but it is tradition uh, spanning, and it's not just an incidental overlapping consensus, I think it's something really deep in human experience that's being appealed to there on an other than, cog well it's not not cognitional, it's not rational in the strict sense of the word, but not irrational or anti-rational. Okay, and then the last thing, uh, last kind of point I'd like to make is, is a set of questions. So. The first two were appreciations, and this is sort of half appreciation and half question. And this is where I get more Christian theological. And it, it has to do with a political concept in your book and a theological concept. And the political concept is the role of punishment in restoring the social order, the dignity of the victims, and also, as you are trying to argue, uh, the dignity and flourishing of the perpetrators. And I'm not so sure that I buy everything you say about punishment restoring the perpetrators. But let me just expand, okay? So, first of all, I definitely think punishment is necessary as part of a concept of reconciliation, as a concept of justice. But the question is, why? And I think the main reason for it is to overcome the narrative of the lie and the ethos of impunity. Um, one thing I followed a little bit is the fate of UN Resolution 1325, which is about sex and gender-based violence toward women during conflict, but a after conflict, when it continues apace, even though there are accords signed uh, that the um, you know hostilities are over and women will be protected, and everyone gives lip service to this and nobody implements it. Okay, well I shouldn't say nobody, but you know. Um, so impunity is really bad and punishment is really necessary, at least of identified representatives or egregious perpetrators. Um, however, when we look for a theological explanation, that's where I had the questions. And one of the things that you put out in your book 
or you discuss at some length, is a Christian doctrine of atonement through the cross and how it's interpreted. And I am totally with you in your critique of some traditional atonement theories that see the cross as God's punishment of sinners in the person of an innocent victim. And feminist critics and anti-militarist critics and all kinds of other liberationist critics have said that's a really bad image. It sets God up as violent, unforgiving, and as being satisfied by the death of an innocent man. So there's all these other explanations. God's solidarity with the victims, God entering into human suffering, etc. And you lift up the thought of Jürgen Moltmann, whom I also like very much, who argues the cross has to somehow also uh, um, uh, represent God's solidarity with the perpetrators, with sinners and converting sinners. But my question is, why do we need punishment and what, need, what does convert sinners? And I think we need punishment, if you're going to bring in a theological doctrine, it would be more eschatology. That is, the kingdom of God is both present and not yet. So it's this brokenness of historical circumstances that you spend so much time on in elaborating the ambivalence of the whole situation, which I think is 100% correct. Um, the new interpretations of the cross that you turn to tend to emphasize much more somehow, you know, trying to reinterpret it in light of love, forgiveness, reconciliation, and solidarity, okay? And my question is, punishment is necessary, but what actually converts perpetrators? And I kind of felt like, even in the examples in your book, that what was really converting perpetrators who, for example, were on trial or incarcerated was not the fact that they were being punished as such, but education or recognizing the extent of their crimes. That's what Moltmann mm -hmm. says about himself. He was a soldier in Hitler's mm -hmm. army. And finally, when he realized what had really happened, you know, yeah. he despaired, but then realized there was hope. Um, um, the ability to meet with victims, especially important is the, is the ability to do something constructive or reconstructive, like somehow do something to make amends. But just to punish in and of itself, while necessary, I'm not sure rehabilitates the sinner. And, you know, um, I just, you know, I, I still have a lot of uneasiness about retribution and vengeance as part of what we really want to keep in there as a Christian theological meaning. So I think punishment that restores order and undermines impunity, yes, but just retaliation, I have a bigger problem with, and I'm not sure we've got the theological rationale. So it's just, I, you just left me thinking about that, but it was a very rich discussion. So that's it. I've probably gone on too long, and I'm going to quit. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Professor Cahill. Uh, we now turn to um, Professor Mohammed Abu Nimer, uh, who uh, is uh, really, uh, as far as I am aware, and I know Dan knows far more about this entire area than, than I do, but my own uh, uh, research and uh, looking into the area of conflict resolution, there really is nobody like Muhammad Abu Nimer. Um, he uh, is uh, the most, uh, I think, well-respected uh, scholar from the Islamic tradition, uh, working on issues of forgiveness, uh, conflict resolution, uh, and peace building. Uh, he has an extraordinary uh, track record, both as a scholar uh, and as a practitioner. Uh, he is a professor in the International Peace and Conflict Resolution Program at the School of International Service and director of the Peace Building and Development Institute at American University. He is an expert on conflict resolution and dialogue for peace. Um, much of his work is focused on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and on application of conflict resolution models in Muslim communities. Uh, we're delighted and honored to have you, uh, Professor Abu Nimer. Thanks so much. Thank you uh, for your kind words here. Um, again, thank you, uh, Dan, and uh, uh, also the Berkeley Center for uh, inviting me for this uh, event. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be here as well, uh, among colleagues who are also interested in the, the same concepts and, and themes that I've been both struggling with uh, understanding and also struggling with ways to convey them to people I work with around the world as well. 
Um, I kind of, I'm, I'm glad because Professor Cahill here uh, took the theological hat, so I don't have to wear it. <laughs> so I am not really a theologian, uh, although I've written about Islam and uh, nonviolence, but I'm not really a theologian. I'm going to talk today about uh, the sociology of it and the political science of it, and also more important for me than the theory is uh, how can these concepts the ethics of reconciliation be used, implemented, and uh, applied in a conflict situation, because I think that's one of the major contribution of this uh, text. Uh, the book, as Dan put it out, is really uh, the ethics of uh, political reconciliation. And to take po reconciliation into politics uh, is really one of the main, main uh, contribution that we can, uh, sort of a generic one that we can characterize the book uh, with and I think we, at least I'm personally and professionally grateful for having such a text. I was sharing with Dan before we started that uh, yesterday in my class at uh, Reconciliation and Justice at AU, I teach it for about 12 years now, uh, we were referring to some of these uh, exact dilemma that uh, he, uh, his first chapter or introduction uh, uh, put us there or put for us there to look at them. So there is no doubt that the text comes in a timely fashion uh, to fill a gap that we need. And the gap here is to take the reconciliation from the individual into the collective, to take the reconciliation from the, um, um, let's put it this way, from the uh, uh, liberal peace paradigm into the peace building, into the uh, interfaith uh, sphere or area as opposed to leaving it be defined by uh, USAID, uh, DFID, or JICA, and these are the development agency that fund some of the so-called, or also the World Bank, I should say, uh, because I did work with them on reconciliation projects defined by the World Bank as well. I'm coming from the practice, and that's where I will go. I will mention a few other unique contribution that I see them, and then I'm hoping to share with Dan and with you six problems that I have. Not problems with the text or with the, with the book, but six questions that I'm struggling with them. And I think uh, Dan's uh, um, manuscript or book uh, address them in, in some ways, but I have some question that I would love, love to, to sort of share them with you. So the unique, I mean, there, is no, there is no argument beyond the, the introduction when Dan says that there are 43% of negotiated settlement revert back to violence within five years. And that's, that should be shocking to, to all politicians who negotiate agreements and then turn their back and say, okay, we have peace in this country. So this is, this is something uh, is there. The second thing he says, or, or I think it's well known as well, the liberal peace paradigm uh, that is motivating UNDP, uh, um, NATO, uh, I mean, both political arm as well as development arm, in applying their uh, projects, programs, intervention in the world is really this, this kind of liberal peace paradigm that says, um, uh, let's focus, let's build the houses, let's build the bridges, and let's build the uh, prisons, of course. We build the first thing, prisons and security, and they call it rule of law, and then we democratize them by teaching them how to do election and do the whole infrastructure and institutional building. Very important, very crucial. But again, we stop there. So in a budget of $45 million mm -hmm. given from the World Bank into uh, re reconstructing, uh, supporting the peace building in Mindanao, Mindanao in 1996, out of the 45 million, there were half a million for reconciliation and 44 and a half to build infrastructure and development. And when we negotiated back and forth, they increased that to about uh, two and a half million. And at the end said, no, we don't actually deal with po uh, reconciliation, this politics. We will subcontract it to groups outside. Uh, that's where the liberal peace paradigm, I think, have been, have been really problematic. And this book comes in to say, look, this approach is not enough to sustain peace agreements and to sustain some kind of relationship, future relationship among ethnic or uh, rivalers in, in this conflict. So we need to uh, present something more than that. And Dan takes the, the challenge, and he says that he wants to uh, 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 present a framework for justice that considers the past as a whole, integrating all of the important 
facets of justice while attending to the particularity of each. It's a big task to uh, suggest a generic, comprehensive framework that addresses all facets of justice in all level, interpersonal or uh, uh, community as well as uh, state or, or inter-ethnic inter relation. And I think he's very smart in that sense to, to the entry use it as the ethics of reconciliation because after all, this whole field is about the ethics of it. So we need to know what are the ethical standards that we are measuring our intervention uh, according to these standards. Are we using local standards? Are we using our own standards? And we're saying these are the human standards, as we usually do uh, from the Northern Hemisphere when we go to settle a conflict in the South. We say, these are the standards you need to go to them. And when people ask why, so oh, these are the human, the universal, the generic. So here is the challenge that Dan really faced. How do I put a generic, comprehensive perception and the framework, at the same time give the localities and the particularities their <coughs> sort of what they deserve in terms of how they perceive justice. And as I said, the ethics of reconciliation is a good way to enter that. Um, several other contribution, I see them really important. And, and you, if you're a practitioner, you understand or appreciate more uh, the need to tell the policy makers that uh, 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 building just institution and relationship between states, just institutions, is, is very important. Not only building institution, but building just institutions. Building right relationships is more important than building the roads, uh, or at least equally important in terms of what we, uh, in terms of our uh, attention for it. Uh, Dan's uh, also, I think, uh, text here says that uh, religion in international politics uh, is not only recommended. He says it's necessary and it's needed. It needs to be integrated. The question, how do we integrate the religious discourse into international politics? And he has some, I have some a uh, question about that that I'm going to pose later, later on. So, uh, and also he's, he's also practical, come from the practice. So he does explore with magnificent examples of acknowledgement, reparation, punishment, apology, and forgiveness. He takes those five components and says they do exist in the world and really give an inspiring set of stories from South Africa all the way to uh, East Timor and to many other parts of the world. Uh, the, the, the book is rich with these stories and whoever likes storytelling would really love to uh, uh, read them and, and look at them. So there is no doubt that the framework introduce is wide enough and wider than the, the liberal peace uh, paradigm that we have because we have a problem with it, the way it frames peace building and the way it frames actually reconciliation. Um, again, I don't want to draw more on the contribution. I think many of the reviewers already talked about it. I, I want to begin sharing with you some of these points where I, I thought that they're challenging to me and they were provocative uh, uh, in terms of how um, uh, Dan uh, present them in. The first one I faced yesterday in my class, I've been teaching it for 12 years, and every year I teach it, I'm more confused about reconciliation. <coughs> and my students also say the same. I'm not sure because I'm not that good of a teacher or because the theme also is really confusing. But uh, the first thing yesterday in the class discussion, we said the students kept saying uh, the, the true, the real reconciliation, when the true and real reconciliation will, ta will take place. And I think uh, Dan's comments here, he argued that reconciliation will only be achieved partially. And I love that because there is no such thing reconciliation, the ideal way, the way that's described in the I think I know this is recorded, but uh, the, the way it's described by the holy books or, you know, by the afterlife. Yeah. That's good for, that's good for uh, internal prayer. But for somebody who lives on the ground, somebody who's dealing with atrocities with massive violence, bringing this formula is great for temporary. But to continue and implement the programs that promise in my lifetime, Israeli and Palestinians, <coughs> will fully reconcile the genuine, the real conciliation is really illusion. 
the students did not like that, but I, uh, this is what the con one of the conclusions I, I came to. So uh, th there is no such thing reconciliation true and genuine. There is a process of living together that we can improve it, and partially through some mechanisms, if we're intentional about it, we can achieve some, some parts of it. I, I'm, I'm arguing here for the generational component. For when we go to intervene in conflicts that require reconciliation, <coughs> not really to bring in a guidebook that says, if you follow this step by step, you will reach the nirvana, you will reach the reconciliation step. And it will be in your lifetime and short, short enough, maybe even within five years, as some practitioners and as some institution have been, have been uh, promising. Mm. The second point is really regarding the evaluation of the standard evaluation. What standards we to use in evaluating just justice uh, of peace building? Uh, again, we have been using, uh, uh, as Dan argued, been using list of criteria, building <coughs> prisons, courts, economic development, number of elections uh, uh, carried out. But then I think he, he, mo he move, move us further by suggesting that we need to take into consideration the healing of the wounds. Uh, he does suggest that, and I think that's a crucial to do it, but we don't get from the text yet, and maybe that's the next step, uh, the itemization of that. We know the, wound, the wounds need to be healed. We know there is lots of injury and trauma, but how, what are the criteria that we're going to use in order to know that we are addressing these wounds and they are, they are healing uh, in, in that sense? I think uh, itemizing, identifying, this is something that might need, need to be developed later on, but we do have a map for it to some extent uh, from the text. The notion of restoring the right relationship based on restorative justice and the central meaning as the central meaning of reconciliation. And he says restoration of right relationship, especially in the realm of politics. Uh, again, I think the main contribution here that we have restorative justice, criminal justice, he takes this approach and brings it into peace building, into politics, and says, look, guys, this works in restorative justice. In, in domestic, local cases, we know it works. How about if we try it in the politics of reconciliation? And I think that's, that's, that's a great, great suggestion to, to move that into it. I, I'm not sure that we have a solid argument there enough to convince the politicians today in Iraq, Shia and Sunni to engage in the restoring the right relationships. I, I don't know if we, have, if we have an answer yet. How do we engage them as politicians? How do we convince them that the, the right relationship is something that they can take and, and move, move up with? Um, of course, you know, the, I mentioned the forgiveness as restoratively defined become complementary to punishment. And I think that's something very, very, uh, very important, very also um, um, very challenging. Because if you look at forgiveness, it doesn't tie with punishment. And uh, uh, I think what Daniel does, he says, if we redefine punishment and if we redefine forgiveness in a restorative way, uh, we might be able actually to find the complementarity between them and solve the issue of the, uh, uh, the contradiction. Uh, and he, he actually suggests something very, uh, very local. He said, look at the local tradition. And I, I, do, I did look at sulha in, in the Middle East tradition. And any, pro any sulha process in the Middle East tradition, also in Islamic tradition in that sense, it will have an element of justice and the justice there will have a punishment. The punishment is not always concrete, tangible. It can be symbolic. But the concept of uh, punishment already exists in that tradition. Some argue, of course, that this usually does not, lead to, uh, does not lead to reconciliation and its temporary arrangement. Nevertheless, at least in that tradition, the punishment and forgiveness are complementary, as, as uh, Dan suggested also in his context. Let me just, because of time, I'm going to move to the last point that I have, because I see my, uh, my friend uh, Mark made it here, so leave some time also for his, his notes. Um, and this is, has to do with the human rights, international human rights, and the notion of role of religion that also my colleague here referred to it. And I like that point in the sense of uh, his argument, we need to have religion into politics. And we need to engage religious actors with the human rights activists, with the secular human rights discourse. 
Um, but again, the, 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 and I think that's very important. It has been said many times as well, but I think he gave very good example why it needs to be done. Mark has done also a great deal of uh, work on this in the need for engaging religious, religious leaders. But one question that, that I have had to, to Daniel regarding this notion, and he says in, uh, in page 99, to be clear, religious actors are not the primary actors who carry out the ethics as I envision it. Mm. The state and its citizen are the main contributors. Religion contributes the conceptual material, a notion of justice. Again, if you read it there carefully, it, I'm not sure if I understood it correctly, but what I, I took from it is that, yes, I want the role of the religious uh, actors to be in political reconciliation, but I need them to be symbolic. I need them to come in as not deciding on the substance of the political agreement. Because after all, his frame, Daniel frame, comes from international human rights. And he says, this is the foundation, and this is the base. And the international human rights, as we know it, is framed and presented as a secular humanist discourse. So, and he said, come engage with the religion, but only engage with it as a symbolic or have it representative there. And he gave the first page of the book, talks about Desmond Tutu challenge in the TRC, should he open with a prayer or not? And he try without the prayer, and then he says, no, that doesn't feel right. Hmm. The question that we pose here, according to the politics of reconciliation and the role of religion, can we expect uh, Desmond Tutu and his alike, the Sheikh and the Mullah in Iraq and others, to negotiate and be heads of negotiation team and decide the themes and the substance of the negotiated uh, reconciliation process and not only invite them as symbolic a blessing or a partial role. The question for us, I think that he puts out there, and also that's what I got, this challenge, where do we have the religious leaders in dealing with reconciliation. Do we put them in the center of the stage? Or do we say, no, we are in the center of the stage. We politicians, policy makers, uh, uh, secularly frame the issue. And then we would like to get your help to market the agreement or to give some blessing for it. And that issue is not, is not as clear in the text. And I'd love to hear your comment about the role of those, of those religious, uh, religious leaders. Uh, and maybe through, by bringing the religious leaders into the center, as I argue, maybe we can find a common language with the Muslim world today because we keep telling them in many of these policy makers who are Islamists these days, look, if you wanna talk to us, you have to take our language, our discourse of human rights, but not necessarily your discourse because either we don't know it or we need to keep your religion in the private sphere of your life or we think what you have is not good enough considering the criteria that we, we use. So it means with Morsi, with Ghanoushi in Tunisia, it means with the Iranian uh, mullah, it means with the Shia leaders, we have to find the language, not a secular language, but religious language to be legitimate and the substance in dealing with these contexts. Thank you very much. Well, um, I'm delighted to say that uh, uh, Mark Gopin is, is here. Mark is already forgiven. Uh, he's an easy person to forgive uh, because he brings so much to our conversation. Um, uh, uh, Professor Gopin uh, has a, a long track record of thinking and uh, uh, acting in the area of uh, peace building, uh, conflict resolution. Uh, and the relationship between religion uh, and peace build, building, really a pioneer in this entire uh, area. Uh, he is the James Lau Professor of Religion, Diplomacy, and Conflict Resolution. Uh, he directs the Center on Religion, Diplomacy, and Conflict Resolution at George Mason University's Institute for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. Uh, George Mason University's Institute being among the foremost institutions in the world that deals with conflict resolution. He's traveled internationally uh, to lecture, to conduct seminars uh, in peace building. Uh, he's the author of uh, a, a number of uh, books, uh, including the forthcoming To Make the Earth Whole, Creating Global Community 
in an age of religious militancy. He is an ordained rabbi uh, and received a PhD in religious ethics from Brandeis in 1993. Uh, since 2008, uh, Mark has worked with the Fetzer Foundation on a video book project focused on enemies turned friends. Thanks so much for being with us and for, for, for getting here <laughs> very, very quickly. Yeah, yeah uh, <laughs> considering the fact that, uh, well, my, my iPhone uh, recorded two dates, September 8th and September 14th, and they both were in black, and, but it gave me the, the calendar for September 8th, not September 14th. So I, I deeply apologize. So about a half hour ago, I was, I was on a lazy day about to spend time writing with my uh, daughter and my son <laughs> up in Rockville. And so that was a half hour ago. And, um, uh, but I'm, so I'm very sorry about the iPhone glitch. Um, the, uh, by the way, the, the, the film project is done and the uh, book is coming out in the next month or two from Oxford. It's called Religion, uh, um, Friends Across, uh, I don't remember what it's called. It's about, it's, uh, it's about peace partners across an impossible divide on the, st the inner lives and examination of the inner life of Arab and Jewish peacemakers in the Middle East. And it reflects uh, a focus that I've gone into the intra-psychic um, um, I'm, in, I'm in a mood these days, and my, my future research and, and practice is focusing more and more on all of the things that lead to a nonviolent earth. And I, I'm, I'm more and more convinced that, that legal processes of justice and just war are deeply related to relational issues. And my previous books were very much on the relationship. And obviously, forgiveness and apology are at the center of healing relationships. Uh, but the intrapsychic really interests me as well, and that is uh, apologies and forgiveness to yourself, how you grow, how you change, who, become, who becomes a peacemaker and why, what are their qualities, how do they survive in that work, um, what kind of growth does that involve. So that's where, where I'm at. So I want to say a few things in about five minutes. Five minutes. Um, it, as I just said, um, I think what's really interesting and evolving in our work, and I think this is what's so important about what Dan has accomplished, is that many of us are what, what's called scholar practitioners. And it's a very uncomfortable combination because the, you know, if you're a little bit too much in the scholarship, then you completely lose touch with the reality. Uh, it really, it's like a hairbreadth. You can immediately lose touch with reality. And if you're, if you're completely immersed in projects, which is what they do, you really lose your brain for th reflection. It's just amazing how much it's, how hard it is to be immersed in what it takes to, you know, throw a million dollars at a problem and not completely be immersed in the politics of that and the complexity of that and, and so on. So I've been, um, what I think is so important about what Dan has accomplished is taking a lot of the issues that we've raised in our original books, uh, myself and, and Dr. Muhammad, who's my mentor and colleague, um, it, we raised many things, and we expected and hoped for people to deepen it, uh, deepen it with scholarship, especially around the issue of justice and, and, and injustice and the relationship between uh, uh, the future of the state in many ways. The future of the state is, and, and, and global organizations of state is, one, is, is the central, in my, in my opinion, is the central question of to what degree the earth will become more or less violent in the future. Because if you look throughout history, there's always been an interesting and dichotomous relationship between spiritual authority and worldly authority. Uh, in biblical texts, it's, it's divided between the prophet and the king. Um, and may, in many ways, this, we, we talk a lot about secularism. And secularism is a very problematic topic that a lot of us are thinking about because what looks secular is actually religious, what looks religious is actually very secular. Um, the, the best way to understand religious institutions is by acting as if it's not religious at all in terms of the analysis of what the power relations and the needs and all of these things. So secular is a problematic term and it's much easier to look at sovereign, you know, in the sense of the sovereign. And the sovereign happens to be now uh, in, some, in some of the world at least, moderately democratic. The United States is moving on its way to more and more democracy, I believe and hope. And, 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 and democracy is an ideal that we want many, many countries to move towards, greater and greater empowerment of more people. And so more and more people are involved in their being the sovereign 
in some sense. But it's still a question of the sovereign, which is, an, which is, which is a, a, a construct that necessarily involves what, what some people call secular, but really is the compromise of many, many different constituencies, some of whom are religious, some of whom are secular, some of whom are anti-religious. And that's the sovereign. And then there's this question of religious actors, consciously religious actors, then many others who are not consciously religious but spiritual. They're not identified with a power group called the church or the synagogue or the chief rabbinate in Israel or anywhere. They are, they're simply, they have motivations that are, that are spiritual. The question for the future, Dan is, 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 our, is, is emphasizing the state because the state is the key. Think about it. It's, it's great. I mean, I've, I've argued in my books, we've argued in practice, we've, we've done everything we could to, to bring uh, religious actors into the center. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an impossible process because secular authorities consider them a threat immediately, even the best of them. So we tried, we tried to bring in religious actors, uh, Muslim and Jewish, into the peace process in Camp David peace process. And, and now everybody's talking about their categories, about looking at Jerusalem in a very different way that would be conciliatory. It would be a city for all peoples. But, but 10, 15 years ago, they laughed at us. Now they use that language. And of course, it's too late because the politics and the, the ground shifted so badly that, that many of those advanced ideas coming out of spirituality and religion are, 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 are not effective when the ground is already so destructive. But, but we had such a hard time being acknowledged, okay? The irony is that Yasser Arafat acknowledged our, our, our categories, but, but, but what we were laughed at by the Israeli administration, the American administration at the time. And now people are adapting some of those ideas too late. It's the same in many other places. We, I just finished a project, or I'm in the middle of finishing a project with 100 Afghan imams, 150. And we, we finally gave them you know, some voice but it's, it's a very messy situation and people don't want to acknowledge and many people are, even in organized religions, are afraid of Afghan imams. They don't even want to meet with them because they're so afraid of them. So there's many ways in which this is a difficult pro process of bringing the actual actors. But much more important than the actors is what principles are going to guide your prison system. I mean, think about it. Think about the consequences in Afghanistan and Iraq and in the United States of all the people in prison, what legal structures are governing their lives? Those people are going to go out and kill and rob again. They're going to live lives of crime or apology, forgiveness, uh, acknowledgement, a deep immersion in their inner lives is going to be a part of the process of the state rehabilitating them or the state is going to be governed by revenge. This goes back to Aeschylus and Sophocles. It's not, it's very old. And unless the state is infused with an enlightened approach to the criminal, then the criminal just gets worse and we have a perpetual state of violence in many sub-societies. That's not something that a chaplain or a priest can fix by himself. That's a choice of the state. Now, the state doesn't have to be threatened by the fact that this comes from a religious source because a lot of enlightened ideas have come from religious sources for, for since the beginning of time. It's a question of how we modify and modulate that discussion. Do we make it a threatening discussion and say, you know, the answer is only with Jesus or the answer is only in the Torah? Then you're going to get people's back up in many places in Israel, and, and, and rightly so. But if it's framed in a way in which we're all contributing to the more enlightened and advanced notions of democracy and engagement with human success and human failure, and human evolution of relationships, then we stand a chance of making the democratic idea better and better and better. And that's, that's I think, where we're, we're at a stage of history where, you know, Immanuel Kant would be very proud of us, but we have to keep going. You know, he also, deep spiritual foundations of his universal categories, but, but the project is still evolving. We need a security council, the UN, that has some of these values and these consensus. We need a global process where the secular and sovereign constructs of the world become imbued by the kind of values that Dan has put forth in the book. And I celebrate that. Thank you very so. much. Yeah. 
Well, uh, thank you um, all uh, for your comments. I would like to move straight to uh, the audience uh, and uh, would ask you all, uh, anyone who has a question, simply to raise your hand. Uh, identify yourself when you ask your uh, question. Please do uh, try to ask a question and, and be as brief as you can. We have uh, only about 15 to 20 minutes uh, for conversation. Uh, I may ask at a later point uh, uh, Dan to respond to some of the questions that have been raised, but perhaps in the context of answering uh, other questions. So, uh, uh, Professor uh, Love from Catholic University, please. Uh, and just, just be, I don't think we need a microphone, just, just uh, again. Question of how to sell this idea to particularly <coughs> some here sovereign authorities, but, but others, how to, um, how to um, engage this them in the idea of what's possible, what is politically possible. So each of you have, have started to dive into this, how do you compare the ideal versus the reality of a partial solution, of progress on this. But the, the politics of despair is so deeply rooted. And the politics of how little is possible in the movement towards peace is so deeply rooted. This idea that all we could do is build roads and bridges and hope they won't blow them up again. So any ideas you have about how to sell that to a political system that seems so little possible in the realm of reconciliation. I'll say a couple things. I mean, um, I think there's a danger when you talk about reconciliation. Um, it has a, inevitably has a kind of um, utopian ring to it. So it implies a kind of final state where everybody's uh, reconciled with everybody, and uh, you know the kind of notion of embrace and, and so forth. But um, I think that if you're willing to uh, look at it as something that happens in the political realm and something that is, you know, uh, um, partially achieved. That, it, in other words, um, there's, uh, I outlined six practices. Some of them are going to happen in some countries, others in other countries. Any one of them is going to be, you know, from zero to 100, you know, somewhere in here. And um, if, if you look at that, then I think you can see that, in fact, all six of the practices have taken place all over the globe with a range of uh, successes and failures, just like everything else. And that um, in uh, m many places on the globe, they've actually achieved concrete results that have helped countries to move on in ways that they wouldn't have otherwise been. The example that I um, began with, uh, which was Uganda, um, again, one, one approach saying, Try, try the, the main uh, perpetrators and mainly focus on uh, human rights and the rule of law. But then the Atolian Religious Leaders uh, Peace Initiative came along um, proposing the a Amnesty Act that's tied to a major reintegrative process, um, talking about forgiveness, talking about using traditional rituals of reconciliation and reparation. Well, that was essential for getting uh, you know, several tens of thousands of people out of the army, back home, um, two million people from inter internally displaced camps back home. I don't want to simplify and say that that was the whole thing, but this approach actually, you know, achieved the results of getting them to where they are. Again, partiality. I go to Uganda in August. They say, no, we don't have peace. I think what they really mean is we only have negative peace where the shooting has stopped. We have a long way to go. But I think it was that kind of um, inspiration and that approach which enabled them to, you know, get that far, which was, which was pretty significant. Um, you know, in South Africa, for instance, um, even apart from all the religious talk of reconciliation and anything else, you had a terrible dilemma. Um, either you try the apartheid leaders, in which case you might have a civil war, or you do nothing, in which case you have no legitimacy for this new uh, system among, among the majority blacks. Um, how do you thread the needle? It was a very difficult situation. Well, the concept of reconciliation was far from perfect, many drawbacks, but actually didn't give the, that kind of middle ground that helped them to move forward and said, we're not going to get major punishments and trials, but we can tell a national story about what happened and help a lot of people to, to know about the, tr the truth about what happened to them in the way that they never would have otherwise. Even there were even some cases of um, you know, major apartheid leaders who kind of had a change of heart, um, you know, and so forth. So I, I do think there are some practical um, results that can be that can be shown for it. Roger. I'm just wondering if you think the very existence of the International Criminal Court can stand in the way of reconciliation. Yeah. 
Well, interestingly, there are some aspects of the International Criminal Court to be more fair and nuanced that um, take into account some kind of reconciliation dynamics. For instance, um, in cases where the criminal court looks like it's going to get in the way of a peace process, they are permitted to delay the prosecutions. Um, they're supposed to give first dibs to the local prosecuting kind of mechanisms, and as opposed to going straight to the Hague, if Uganda can handle it, you guys do it on the local level. Um, there's also a reparations program that has now been introduced into the court that is supposed to uh, complement trials with reparations. Um, the center of gravity is still the trials, but there are some, it has kind of um, complexified in a reconciliation direction. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, John Derrick. Uh, it would seem that uh, it requires an enormous reservoir of goodwill to move the process forward in any society. But in promoting democracy, you're promoting competition among different parties who benefit from ex promoting and exploiting differences. Yeah. So why wouldn't uh, democracy work against right. reconciliation in the long run? Yeah. Well, it's a great question. I mean, what, one of the schools of thought is um, on, on these questions kind of criticizes the reconciliation model. It's no, these are known as the agonistic theorists, so agonism meaning you know, contestation. They say, well, the real goal is just to get a kind of democratic system with, with peaceful contestation, get people to disagree and to carry on arguments and so forth. Um, but I think, as, as you suggest, there's a kind of vociferousness to that by which contestation and argument to easily, <laughs> in a very fragile society that's been fighting war, dictatorship, and so forth, very easily can threaten to uh, tear it apart again. My, my response is that I think democracy, first of all, I think it is constitutional liberal democracy, uh, involves much more than contestation. I, I think it involves a lot of shared values, um, like, like human rights, like um, you know, co mutual commitments to the dignity of the citizen, being willing to respect the person who you've been deeply disagreeing with, but respect them in terms of their full rights as a, a citizen, a certain level of civility. So I think that, um, in order for the contestation to be healthy, I think you need a lot of um, a shared consensus as well. So that's partly what these processes are uh, designed to bring about. I, I, I just want to point out that the two previous questions uh, uh, raise the issue of realism, pragmatism in the context of, um, of, of, of democratic argument. And that's been there since the beginning of the idea of democratic arguments in, you know, in, in, in Greece. And of course, it's possible for dem democratic argument to be demagogic argument, where there is no practicality, there is no pragmatism, there's just about polarizing constituencies. But it's also the case that many human beings have a, a, a practical, enlightened self-interest. And when you can sell forgiveness and apology and say it works, and that the recidivism rate is lower among criminals, that the recidivism rate is lower among civil war, that civil wars did not happen after X, that the majority of United Nations missions actually succeed, as opposed to the ones we know that are not succeeding, and that you can document that rationally for most people and make it simple, I think we can sell this better, despite the fact that politics will always polarize. So I think it's a very good critique, and it means that our field has to grow and get more funding for serious evidence and the history of evidence of why these nonviolent efforts actually pay off uh, for society. Of course, there's always, I mean, we're, we're witnessing a, a fascinating moment in American politics, too, where, you know, the fact checker kind of uh, critique going on here. Ultimately, despite polarization, if you get too far away from the facts, you lose politically. And so I think we need to focus on the facts of where these nonviolent approaches actually. Uh, um, are, better, are, are better for society in the long run, and we, we have to prove it. So the burden is on us to be better at this, not so puffy. Uh, we can do that among ourselves, but to show the hard evidence. Thank you. Uh, though I, I wonder, uh, just to play the devil's advocate here, whether the comments that have been made, uh, including by Dan, by you, Mark, uh, in the last few minutes, do they really respond to the very challenging and poignant question that Professor Abu Nimer put to us. I mean, and the specific question, how do you convince politicians in Iraq right now, uh, given the tit-for-tat violence that's happening horrifically, how, how do you convince them right now that they can actually move towards right relationship 
and reconciliation. Um, I mean, I, I think that this is still, you know, a, a very, very difficult question. Do you want to uh, say something more? Even that Iran, just let's come to the country here. Yeah. yeah. We, you know, we, we've had a history of 300, 400 years of slavery, right? And the history of 108 years of segregation. How can you convince in Washington here policymakers that they need to do the acknowledgement, the reparation, the punishment, the apology in order to achieve forgiveness here. So it's not really yeah. Iraq where the killing, but yeah. here where we have this denial that we had such past. And after all, the book, the text here says this is about the past. How do you deal with the past? So how do you convince uh, the Congress here that our race relation is a thorn in, in, in our reality in a way that's holding at least 20 to 30 percent of the population back. But what, how do we do that? And we don't have that, that external violence. Maybe we'll get another question and then we'll let, we'll let Dan uh, uh, respond. Yes, sir. Can you just speak up a little bit with the air conditioning? In tune with what Dr. Abu Nimer says, and I want to go back to South Africa. Uh, Ambassador Rasul uh, came here to this country, and he said a couple of things I thought that were very interesting. And again, we are having problems in South Africa again. There is a people there. But he said initially, they created a constitution that was based on the idea of human dignity as opposed to human freedom. Our constitution is about liberty. Theirs is about dignity. But liberty also means the liberty to take advantage of as many people as you can and the freedom to do that. And without some kind of economic justice and fairness. Now, I'm not just talking about niceness. There are people who are at a survival level. And there's a trauma. Life is very traumatic if you're living on this basis of safety and physical survival too long. And if there isn't a sense of the return of opportunity, not just the justice of equaling things out, but the, the return of some opportunity and some way of living that's a good way, that's a hopeful way, why should anyone invest in a future that's going to be peaceful? Why lay down arms if you feel the elites are just going to restore the same system, whether east or west? We've got a series of powerful challenges to the uh, possibility of an of a ethic of political reconciliation. Uh, uh, Professor Cahill, do you want to jump in at this no, point? That's okay. And, okay, all right. Dan, do you want to yeah. make, make a comment or two on these questions? I mean, one thing, the uh, time and place when reconciliation practices happen, um, it's often, often highly, um, you know, it doesn't happen in isolation from the kinds of things that, you know, uh, much more familiar factors that bring um, uh, political leaders to uh, to the places they get. I mean, I think of like, for instance, the apartheid movement, um, anti-apartheid movement. You had um, reconciliation was a, a an important theme of the um, resistance, but um, it was insisted that you know there had to be an end to apartheid through international pressure. And and let's not forget that the ANC was an armed movement. It wasn't a nonviolent uh, movement. There was a nonviolent aspect as well, but. There was partly through uh, armed pressure, many different kinds of pressure that finally uh, brought the, um, uh, that regime to an end. And then, um, uh, you know, it was after that, that in, in the transitional process that they had the forgiveness and the truth telling and the acknowledgement and so forth. So there, there's a timing to things that is highly contingent upon. And certainly, I mean, part of what I emphasize in the, one of the chapters was that reconciliation I, I think in a certain sense, a kind of oppositional struggle, even sometimes a just war, can be thought of as part of restoring right relationship. If that sounds crazy, uh, you know, Aquinas and Augustine thought that the purpose of a just war was to bring a just peace. Um, and, then, and then finally, yeah, I think that the, uh, the economic uh, inequalities are also a part of right, of right relationship. And in some cases, like South Africa, where it really hasn't changed too much that's essential, and that's essential, going to be essential for a just peace if they uh, address that. Yeah, I just want to I just want to emphasize the uh, in thinking about the practicality of this and what we've seen in the field. It's important to atomize the idea of forgiveness and apology. Don't take it too literally in 
terms of the formal processes like the what happened in South Africa. There's many, many levels of components of apology and forgiveness that work in different cultures in different ways. For example, and, and, the, and, the, and that the, the paradigm shifts of when things balance towards peace or away from it is individual decisions. It's Taliban, it's people in madrasas in Pakistan, it's settlers, it's all sorts of people who are making a decision at every moment. Do I keep going with this endless war or do I, do I change? And sometimes that act of acknowledgement, like I know many Jews who were converted when Palestinians went and, and visited the Holocaust Museum and went to Auschwitz and so on. For them, that acknowledgement was their moment of reconciliation and forgiveness, but not for many others. And then there are people for whom, uh, you know, this Iran loves Israel moment is just, how the hell can I think about bombing that entire country when I see all these wonderful people? And it's a moment of, 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 of a forgiveness moment, despite the regime in Iran and so on. So that atomization of this to individuals is a very important way of seeing the pragmatism of this. It doesn't work for everybody, but the, but the pressures that we're working on here of apology and forgiveness are about shifts in populations and the different ways to do that. And it's practical, and it actually you know, works. Uh, in, in, uh, and, and, and the more that governments get behind it, the bigger the prize, the more, because the government has the power. I can say anything I want to a Talib in a madrasa, but he doesn't know whether he's gonna be safe unless the American government and the, and the Karzai government and the others and the Pakistanis, and they're all ready for that person to normalize and they won't be killed. That, that takes more formal processes that, that he can see. Everybody's making these calculations at every minute. Not everyone is a committed violent person. And, that's, and, the, and in that is hope. There, in that is the practical possibilities. We've got time for one more question. Yes. Um, I'm Diane Perlman, School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. Right. give Dan the last word in response to that uh, very interesting comment and question. And Dan, as you do that, could I just ask you to do one thing? There, there was a very interesting and powerful question that Lisa Cahill ended her remarks with about the role of punishment, and it's in some ways related to yeah. your comment, that the victim has to, has to come to a place where the victim is prepared to forgive. Uh, is there perhaps a suggestion in that comment that there might be a role for punishment? Is punishment Mm -hmm. uh, related to the process of 
um, the victim coming to a point where, where he, uh, he or she can forgive? If not, uh, what is the role for punishment in reconciliation, if, if any? Lisa Cahill offered some mm -hmm. reasons that, to suggest that actually doesn't really play a role um, well, in helping the perpetrator it. to, yeah. it plays a kind of role, but it not with respect to the yeah. conversion of the perpetrator. Role, yes, that's not, right. Yeah. But what does it mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I mean, one of the things I stress in the book is um, the interrelationship of the practices. And so, obviously, apology and forgiveness are related in the ways that you uh, suggested. Um, and, but I think uh, punishment can come in as well. I think in many situations, um, victims are much more ready to forgive um, uh, when they, you know, have had some kind of renunciation of the act uh, of wrong, either on the most powerfully on the part of the perpetrator if the perpetrator apologizes, but it could be through seeing um, accountability, through reparations. But I think particularly um, one of the phenomena that I found over and over again is victims who are willing to drop their demand, even drop their demand for punishment, when there is something that kind of delegitimates or um, counter, there's a counter communication against the wrong, that I think what is Often most difficult for victims is to feel like there's nothing that is kind of legitimated or recognized. There hasn't been any kind of recognition of them that they have suffered wrong, that it has been a wrong, that they're now citizens again, and, and, and so forth. And oftentimes um, demands either for retribution or revenge, which I don't think are the same thing, but either um, can, be can be dropped or much softened when there is some kind of uh, recognition and, and validation is often what, uh, what is wanted the most. Not to generalize that not every victim wants the same thing. One of the remarkable things, though, I found, though, was uh, surveys of victims ar ar around the world and what they want after being victimized. And it was remar remarkable to me how um, small of a percentage the kind of retribution demand was. Most of them wanted some re recognition, acknowledgement was a biggie, um, some kind of reparation, some kind of the truth to be told. So because in a sense, what, what, what the, the crime went with a lie, a lie about them. And they want, they want people to know, to know the truth and to kind of set things aright in terms of the understanding. And that's one of the, I think is one of the main purposes of punishment. Um, I mean, uh, I could explain it in much greater length, which I won't, but punishment I try to um, articulate as restorative punishment. It's aimed at, res um, aimed at kind of um, addressing lots of different wounds caused by the violence. But I think one of the biggies is, is what I call the standing victory of injustice, the sense in which the injustice sort of still stands and is still legitimated and stood by in terms of the perpetrators and so forth. And I think that's what human rights activists mean when they say they want to counter a culture of impunity, that why do Chilean human rights activists still want to prosecute Pinochet long after he is defanged and he's an old sick man? Is it because they're bloodthirsty or something? No, it's because I think they want th they don't feel that there has been a, a adequate counter communication to what Pinochet did and stood for, and that's what they really want to see. I think it's that addressing that standing victory of injustice. I think in some way, as part of the restorative model, punishment also. I mean, I I try to defend what I call a communicative theory of. So punishment is about communicating also to the perpetrator the injustice. So society, the state acting on behalf of society, communicates to the perpetrator that what you did was unjust, that we're delegitimating and so forth. But there's also a kind of invitation to, um, to come around, that hopefully you too would join in this. Now, well, you know, empirically, whether that happens or not, um, you know, one, can, one can debate. Um, in terms of finally, in terms of perpetrators changing heart, I mean, just empirically, I find that that ha happened most when they are part of some truth-telling process. And in some kind of truth-telling forum, they're brought face-to-face -face with victims where they see the humanity and the reality of the suffering that they caused. And, I, you know, the, the number of perpetrators who sort of have a change of heart is probably very small as a percentage of all the perpetrators. But when they do, I think it's usually in the context of some kind of uh, truth-telling uh, encounter, some process. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dan Philpot. Thank you, Mark Gopin. Thank you, Lisa Cahill. Thank you, Muhammad Abu Nimer. And thank all of you. Uh, I cannot actually think of, of a book that is a more appropriate one for the Berkeley Center for Religion, <coughs> Peace, and World Affairs to be talking about. Uh, we are the Berkeley Center for uh, Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, not just about religion, peace, and world affairs. And this book really is a book for peace. 
uh, and four, the role of religion in bringing peace to a world that we know uh, is far from peaceful in too many places. Thank you for being part of this important discussion. Thank you.